right, so good afternoon and good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through over 50 monthly live free interactive broadcasts. For many of you, it's your first few weeks back in the classroom as teachers and as students, and so welcome back. It's so exciting to have you guys back. I'm sure you guys are having just the best time, and we really appreciate you spending some of your first few weeks with us. Now, this is a very special week. This is Canada Science Literacy Week, the largest science festival coast to coast across the country with hundreds of live and virtual events going on. And to celebrate that, we are joining forces with the Canadian Association of Science Centers for this epic week of wonder. I know some of our classes live and on YouTube have been joining all week long, which is great. If you're new to this and this is your first program, well, then we are going to all the awesome science centers coast to coast across the country to feature some of their most amazing virtual offerings. We want to inspire you guys to get back with your classes into these places. These are the ultimate places to go if you want to learn about the world and the cosmos around you. I spent half my childhood in science centers and so I hope you guys get that opportunity soon to go live as well. Now, for today's program, we are on my favorite kind of talk. We've been doing space, I love space. Space is the best, we spend all month of October doing space programs and it rocks. But today we are diving in with live animals. Specifically, we are talking about some of the adaptations, some of the most amazing animals in Saskatchewan that you can find at the Saskatchewan Science Center. So. I'm so excited to dive in. I don't know much about Saskatchewan animals personally. I had the chance to go and visit in person over the summer. It's an amazing journey, an amazing place, but I'm really excited to dive in in great detail with you guys today. So if you're joining us on YouTube, let us know where you're joining from. We will be doing a little quiz today too with Mentimeter from the Saskatchewan Science Center, so stay tuned for that link as well. And without further ado, I want to stop talking and I want to turn it over to Sheila and Matt to blow your minds. So thank you so much for joining us today, guys, and take us away. Good morning. So welcome everybody. I'm so excited you could come today. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to do some land acknowledgements and make sure I don't forget anybody. I'm just going to make sure I check my paper here. So we are so grateful the Saskatchewan Science Centre is actually located on Treaty 4 lands. Treaty 4 is home to the Soto Cree. We got lots of um, them here, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota and the Métis. Um, so we just wanted to acknowledge that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the land as well, kind of intro to that. Um, I know a lot of you are from not here. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview, uh, I noticed some people are from Winnipeg and Calgary, and you guys probably have pretty similar weather to what we have here. Um, so it's in the winter, very cold. The temperatures fluctuate quite a bit. So in the summer, it's very warm and dry. And in the winter, it we can get a lot of snow and it can get down to minus 35 and below, especially with the wind chill. So I know Winnipeg and Calgary, especially you guys are probably familiar with that. Um, but if you're from other parts of the country, that's just to kind of give you guys an idea of what the temperatures are like here and the climate, um, because our theme for Science Literacy Week is climate. So we're going to talk a little bit about climate change in a little bit. And I want to introduce you to some animals that we have. We have two special guests here today that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to switch it over to them in a few seconds here because they're kind of the stars of the show. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about our salamander. He's sitting beside me here. I'm just going to switch my camera so you guys can see him. And we've known each other for quite a while. So you guys can see, oh, he's excited. <laughs> he's excited to come in and see you guys. He's kind of coming up here. So this is called a blotch tiger salamander. And I'm just going to move him over so you guys can see him a little bit better. So his name is Jack. And you guys might notice something a little bit different about him. I'll hold him up to the camera so you can see. And Jesse will jump in and tell me if it's not clear. I want to get it kind of focused so you can see his face a little bit. You might notice something different between this side and this side of him. And I'll give you a second to have a look. So he actually has had an injury and I don't unfortunately know what exactly happened because he is one of our rescue animals. And at the Science Center, pretty much all the animals that we have are rescues. We try really hard not to bring animals in who um, don't, don't need to be in captivity. One of the reasons that he is, is because of these injuries, you'll notice he actually is missing an eye on this side. And on this hand, he's missing a few fingers. So if I can show you here. This hand looks quite different from his other hand. So 
the cool thing about this kind of salamander is they can actually regrow some of their limbs. So that's kind of what happened here. After his injury, he was able to grow some of those fingers back, which is pretty amazing. So salamanders are amphibians. And the reason I wanted to talk about our blotch tiger salamander, his name is Jack, because he has one eye. And um, the reason I wanted to talk about him is because of climate change, amphibians are one of the animals who are really affected by climate change. So if you look at his skin, you might notice that it's damp. And that's for a reason. I'm actually going to add a little bit more water on him from his container. So you can probably notice in his container over here that I had, he was actually in some water. And that's because he can actually breathe a little bit through his skin and he needs to stay close to water. So amphibian actually means that they, they can have kind of two lives. They can live close to water and on land. And in their younger age, they actually are in the water as tadpoles. Um, so they need to make sure that they're close to water. But that also means that any changes in their environment, so where they live close to the water, if that is um, not the right temperature at the right time, or if they come out of hibernation too soon, that can all be really serious for them. So, um, and you can see, oh, he's getting a little bit excited here. So another cool thing about amphibians is actually that when you, you know, kind of noticed when I first picked him up, he was just kind of sitting there and now he's starting to move around. And that's because amphibians kind of like reptiles too, um, they get their heat from outside sources. So unlike me, so my hands are warm just because my body's warming up. Um, it's actually pretty warm in this room right now, but if it was cold, there's things that I can do like shivering or put on an extra sweater or something. Um, and also there's kind of a heater that will kick in in my body to warm it up. But for him, he's actually feeling pretty comfortable now because he's getting some heat from my hand. So that's why he didn't really move too much at the beginning. And now that he's getting some warmth from my hands, he wants to move around a little bit more. So just going to check what you guys can see here. Yeah, so things that he likes to eat are crickets. Here he loves having worms for a treat. And actually, Jack is pretty old. He's been at the Science Center for many years. Yeah, see, now he's moving around a little bit more. I hope it's staying in focus for you guys. It looks like it's okay on my end, but you let me know if it's not. Yeah, he looks great, Sheila. Oh, okay, awesome. <laughs> he's kind of wandering off camera a little bit sometimes, but so I forgot to say his scientific name and it's kind of tricky for me to say, um, but I think it was up on that slide. So their scientific name is Ambistoma Mavoritum Melanosticum. <laughs> Hope I got that right, Matt. <laughs> I, I practice. It's a little bit tricky to say that one. So they are actually found in North America. So a lot of you guys might have actually seen these before. Um, and you might notice that there's a little bit of variation, even among the particular ones that we have. We actually have three salamanders here at the Science Center who are all rescues. And just their different patterns, sort of like we all have a little bit different hair color, eye color, that kind of thing. They're, the pattern of their spots is slightly different even among individuals. So the ones that you, you might have seen might even be the same species, but they might just look slightly different from each other. So they can grow up to about 30 centimeters in total length. He's not quite that long. My hands aren't too big in size. You can tell he's probably not quite 30 centimeters. Um, this one has been here for about four years so far, but he's he's definitely older than that. In 20, uh, They can actually have to be up to 25 years old in captivity. Um, and when I was talking about the food, sorry guys, I'm going to jump back for a sec. Um, so the reason we, I wanted to mention what he eats is because climate and what's available in their environment and their habitat naturally um, is affected by that as well. So if there aren't as many food items or if the food items maybe have chemicals that have, uh, might make them sick, that's going to be really bad for them as well. So you we just want to be really careful with that. Um, but yeah, so in the wild, they might also... He doesn't eat these, but in the wild, he might also eat frogs or baby mice or snakes or slugs, that kind of thing. So awesome. I think I'm going to give him a little bit of a break, <laughs> um, put some water on him again. You guys might notice he's got a little bit of substrate on him. He likes to burrow in the mud in the wild. And actually, another cool fact, this one, I think, I'm not sure if we found him there, but uh, the salamanders that we have, we actually have a... Uh, a man-made lake in Regina and two of the other salamanders that we have were rescues from from there so he wants to come out again um, so I'm going to switch to our next guest if uh, 
you guys want to give me a sec here. Yeah, perfect. While you're doing that and getting the second guess, we've got, of course, the slide deck up. So if you guys want to follow along with some of the slides, we've had the Mentimeter code up as we've been doing this. So 42805630. You don't have to do this, of course, but if you have a separate tab on your computer or device at your desk, by all means, and we'll be highlighting some of the facts about these animals as uh, Sheila's showing them off for us today. So be sure to check out both those things at the same time. Awesome. Yeah, just in case I forget anything, because there's lots to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling Jesse, you guys got to keep me on time because this is one of my favorite topics. So I will just keep going and going. <laughs> okay, it's our favorite topic too. There's nothing. <laughs> you guys don't have anywhere else to be, right? That's right. Okay. Who needs lunch anymore? <laughs> <laughs> so just give me a sec here. I'm just getting our second animal is a reptile. And he also needs to be in some water, so I'm just getting him out there. Okay, you guys can see him, awesome. <laughs> oh, he's feeling a little bit more shy. The salamanders usually aren't too shy, but the turtles. Oh, you're gonna say hi. Here, I'll see if I can zoom in on him a little bit more. I will bring him up close to the camera so you guys can see too. So this is a red-eared slider turtle. And actually, depending on where you guys are from, you might have some of these locally. They are not native to Saskatchewan, but the reason, <laughs> sorry, guy, he's going to be all over the place. Um, he's got lots of energy usually. Um, so the reason I wanted to talk to you about them is actually they have been released by pet owners. They're very popular pets here. Um, but sometimes people, if they don't want them anymore, they unfortunately release them into the wild, which isn't great for them because this isn't actually where they're from. And that's part of the reason why we ended up with, um, this is Sunny. Yeah, he's pretty antsy. Let's see, do you want to walk a little bit? So if you ever heard the term slow as a turtle, I, I don't know. He's pretty fast. <laughs> you guys can probably tell. If I put him on the floor, he'd be gone pretty quick. He's actually pretty fast. Um, why don't you turn this way so everybody can see you? So you can probably notice on the side here, um, the where they got their name, you guys can probably guess, is he's got, I'll see if I can get it to focus on him a little more clearly. So on the side of his face, sorry, it's not focusing the way I was hoping, but I think you guys can still see, um, he's got a, actually a red ear, a red line on him. And part of the reason why I wanted to talk about, to you guys about him today is because in Saskatchewan, we do actually have a native turtle species called the painted turtle, and they look very similar to Sunny, except they are naturally found here, one of the most northern um, locations that they can be found. Sorry, guys, he's really wants to go. See, when they say slow as a turtle, he's not, <laughs> not this one anyway. <laughs> he likes to get going. Um, so they actually uh, sometimes what they'll, they'll call an invasive species. So if people do release these ones in the wild, they can be considered an uh, invasive species and take habitat and food away from the native turtles that are found here, the painted turtles. And they actually look pretty similar. There are some differences. And I think when the PowerPoint slide comes up, you guys will see um, some of those differences on there. So they look a little bit similar in size and shape and some of their coloring but they are not actually the same. So these ones are actually found in the US in tropical climates. So they've adapted really well to being able to live here because <laughs> anyone who's ever been here knows this is not a tropical climate. Um, so they actually are able to survive. So I wanted to show you guys too, in case you haven't uh, seen a turtle up close before, and I think he's gonna let us do it, but he's moving his feet pretty fast. You'll probably be able to see he has webbed feet and his are pretty, pretty obvious. The salamander did too, and I apologize, I forgot to show you a little bit more clearly, but his are a little bit harder to see. But on the turtle, you actually can see he's got claws over here and then webbing between his toes. And usually this is when I would ask you guys, so I'll ask you and you'll have to answer. I can't hear your reply, but maybe you can reply in the chat. What do you think he needs those webbing for? Ooh, I can actually bring classes in to answer live. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, you know what? I love hearing your guys' answers. Why don't we cool. do that? Cool. All right. Well, Rose, Valley, jump in. Rose Valley Elementary, what do you guys think? What do we need the, the webbing for? What does he need the, uh, the webbing oh. for? Okay. Ryan? I don't know. I'm just <laughs> Yeah. Yes? Is, is that it? Do you want any other class to chime in? Or is that like, did they just nail it first try? Well, that's, yeah, that's the right answer. I mean, if sure. other people have stuff to add, you feel free, but that's the main reason, yeah. 
So because they need to live close to the water as well, their habitats, when their habitat changes, it's affected as well too. Did anyone else want to add something? Yeah, we had a, a second one from the Nickel School. So Mr. McEwen's class, you want to unmute your mic. Uh, you guys had a second thought, which I like, outside of swimming. Uh, in the chat. And if I know you're a little ways from the computer. There we go. Oh, there's another okay. thing. So we have a student here, Davin, and he's going to share his idea. Um, okay, so go for it. They only have them on the back because they like to peek their head up when they're in the water to breathe. Oh, awesome. You know what? That is exactly what he was doing before you guys, uh, before he saw you guys. So that's really cool that you thought of that. And you know what also cool just happened? So he's actually shedding some of his, we call them scutes. So turtles have scales, reptiles have scales. Yeah, he really wants to go here. Same as the salamander, he's he's feeling a little bit warmer because of my hands, but also he just likes to move around. <laughs> when he's in his tank, he likes to keep swimming. So you guys can kind of see, so that's a scute that has been shed. And you can actually kind of tell like a tree how many scutes they have helps us um, tell how old they are. So he is actually very old. He's more than 15 years old. We're not sure how old he was when he came to the Science Center. Um, but he has a partner named Cher. So you can probably guess where the names came from. <laughs> That's how long they've been here. Um, and turtles can actually live for a long time. So Matt and I worked at the Science Center for a long time, but even if we worked here for our whole careers and retired, these turtles would still be around uh, long after we retire. So it's pretty cool how long they live and we're glad that they're here to educate students. Um, did anyone have any questions before I put it here? I think he probably needs a little bit of a break here. So if you guys have any questions, your, I'll, uh, I your questions actually. We're, we've had tons of questions about salamanders. Oh, oh, okay, <laughs> awesome. Do you want to jump to those later then? I've, well, we can head to our next thing and we can head to the questions at the end. Are we done with live animals or do you want to share anything else or, or videos or more? Uh, we do have one video that we wanted to share with you guys. So uh, if you guys let me know if we're done with the turtle and I'll put, I think he might need a break. <laughs> yeah, we can put our turtle friend back. Before we go to the video, a really small note. One of the things we've been doing in a lot of these programs is doing a land acknowledgement to begin or highlighting indigenous cultures across Canada. And one of my favorite facts in the world, I don't know if this is all turtles, but it's certainly a lot of them in North America. The big scoots in the middle of their back, there are 13 of them. And the little yes. on the side, there are 28. So 13 months, so to speak, 28 days, you get about the exact amount of days in a year. So you can use the turtle's back as a calendar. It's like a, a, a just a fantastic natural history meets cultural resource thing. I, I have always absolutely love that. Anyway. I'm uh, glad you brought that up, actually, because I, yeah. I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe that's where we get the name Turtle Island from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh cool. We'll, we'll we'll confirm that after the fact. Okay. Um, but I'm yeah. sure. So, I'm sure someone in the group knows if I'm right on that. Very cool. Um. So Matt, yeah, if you want to bring up our video for our third animal, and then we'll dive in with questions with all you guys. We have so many people joining on YouTube and live. It's awesome. So keep those uh keep those thoughts in your head, and we'll play our third animal today to check them out. Very neat. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I'm going to talk over this one a little bit. Um, you guys from, can probably guess from the image that you're seeing why we couldn't bring this one into the office. Um, so this is our great horned owl, Bubo. Uh, its scientific name is Bubo virginianus. So that's where we got the name from. And it is a great horned owl that lives here at the Science Centre. They are commonly found in Saskatchewan and actually all over Canada. You guys might have been able to see them. And the reason that Bubo lives at the Science Center is because, again, has an injury and isn't able to fly. So this is uh, actually the old enclosure that we had. It's been recently updated. And we used to have a webcam up. I'm not sure maybe Matt can answer that one if it's live. I know they had to take it down a little bit um, when we were doing renovations. Um, so Bubo has a nice new enclosure that we've tried to make it as close to uh, what it would be outdoors as possible. And you can also see she's got a nice view of the outside. So sometimes she'll see a rabbit or a, a Richardson's ground squirrel or something outside and she'll get kind of excited. So the reason that uh, Pupo lives at the Science Center is just because as a, as a raptor predator, she wouldn't be able to hunt. 
So she needs to be able to do that, obviously, to eat. And also, um, a cool thing that you might notice if you see her in person is that she'll often, uh, not actually in this video, which is kind of surprising, um, but often when she sees that, probably because she trusts the person that was taking the video, um, but if it's a stranger and she doesn't know if she can trust them, she'll actually turn her body away because it's her wing that was damaged um, so that you can't see the injury. And it's, I thought that was a really cool adaptation that she has, that she knows she's injured and she doesn't want somebody new to know that she doesn't know she can trust them that she's actually injured and has that disadvantage um so unfortunately in the wild if there were pre other predators around they would pick up pretty quick that she wouldn't be able to get away so she's one of our animal ambassadors and she teaches lots of kids and families about owls and our local species here so again um one of the cool things about how they can adapt is they can actually eat a wide variety of food. And when we're talking about climate and tracking climate change, the pellets that owls make, so it's not actually poop, it's something that they spit up, we call it regurgitation. So any of the leftover pieces of the food that they can't digest, like bones or fur, um, they actually just kind of pack into a pellet and spit that out. And, and I know it might sound a little gross, but it's actually <laughs> really cool too, because then scientists can then go and study what's inside those pellets because they have the bones and the fur, right? So they can actually tell what animals those were. And that's a way that they can track where different animals are found because they're kind of expecting, okay, in this area, they're going to find this this number of animals on average, this type of animal. And if all of a sudden they find before that the owls were eating a wide variety of things and now all of a sudden they're not and they're only eating one thing, they might notice, oh, maybe those kinds of animals have moved on to a different habitat. And the other interesting thing um, and another reason why we need to protect habitat for them is because they often stay close to where they were hatched. So they kind of have their territory and they can move within that territory but they can't just, people kind of say, well, why don't animals just go and move somewhere else? And it's not actually that simple or easy for them because they've adapted to live there. Sometimes certain animals can, but they kind of have their territory and that's where they live and that's where they need to find their food. So in captivity here at the Science Center, Bubo likes to eat uh, lots of mice, usually about four or five per day. And we just buy them from a pet store and then we thaw them out from the freezer. And then I recently she's been having some treats of baby chicks. That's kind of a treat for her. So they actually eat their food whole and then they'll they'll have that spit that uh, pellet out after. So I'm just checking if I miss anything. I'm sure I did because there's so many things to talk about about her. Um, so we don't know exactly how old. I know someone's probably going to ask. We don't know how exactly how old she is, but um, she's at least 11 years old. So we don't know exactly how old she was when she arrived at the Science Center. Um, but we, we do know she's at least that long old because she's been here for more than 11 years already. Um, the oldest great horned owl that I could find recorded was 50 years old. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and in the wild, they tend to live about 15, 13 to 15 years in captivity around 20 to 30 years. And because of her injury, we're not really sure, but um, she's actually really healthy besides that. Um, She's doing really well. And another cool thing, uh, people kind of ask, how do you know if it's a male or a female between owls? And it was really hard to tell actually with great horned owls. The females tend to be a little bit larger and the males tend to be a little bit smaller. And she's sort of a smaller sized female. So she's kind of right in the middle. Um, oh, someone was asking how we know the wing was damaged. It's actually missing some of the bones. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, it's actually, so it'd be sort of like, I um, actually maybe we could switch back the camera and I can show you on my arm because um, I think our video is going to run out right away here anyway in a sec. Sorry, I forgot to switch it back, guys. <laughs> um, so, on, so on their wing, this part of their bones are fused so they don't have fingers spread out like we do so basically this part of their arm is not there anymore it's been basically was amputated and from what our vet could tell they she had actually self amputated it because she knew that she was injured so actually all the feathers and the bone on that one wing I think it's this side um, are actually just gone so she wouldn't be able to fly anymore uh, she could still hop and walk around but that's not really enough to be able to get her to find her food or to be safe from other predators.
I think that's all I had for that for now, just to keep on schedule. I could keep going forever, you know, Jesse, but <laughs> this is great. No, you're I want to save time for questions. So we have tons of time for questions. This is great. Okay, awesome. So much interest on YouTube and from our live classes too. And I did want to want to highlight so we are incorrect with the turtle in terms of Turtle Island. It okay. Is Guy Woman creation story of the Haudenosaunee. Uh, again, the, the series of legend stories, myths that underpin Indigenous cultures across Canada are epic. Uh, Indigenous People's Atlas of Canada is one of the sort of go-to sources for this from Canadian Geographic, so I encourage people to look oh, that Oh, perfect. Up. Thanks but, for checking uh, on that. Learn the story of Turtle Island. But yes, let's dive in on these live animals, guys. Live classes, you don't need to share in the chat. I will come to you in person in just a second. Uh, in fact, we're going to begin with Mr. McEwen's class. So I know you guys are just audio, but in Calgary joining us today, if you want to come in for our first question, you are good to go. So share away. And uh, for our YouTube groups, stay tuned. We'll come to as many as we can from you guys as well. But Mr. McEwen, kick us off, and we'll go to Ms. Stoddinger's class next. Let's see. Any questions in Calgary? I can always come second to you guys. I know we've got, in fact, I will come second to you guys. Miss Donninger's class, you guys are right at the camera. So just unmute that mic and you guys are good to go. Welcome in and uh, Ranchlands in Alberta. Hey, everyone's got questions. This is a good problem to have. All right. In fact, all our teachers, if your mics are muted, unmute your mics. It'll make it way easier when we go to Q&A, okay? Uh, let's start okay. with. Nice. Is she or you're in the What's your question? Nice loud voice. My question is, yep. How does that owl turn its head? Yeah. How does <laughs> Lots of questions about owls turning their head. How do they do it? Can they turn them all the way around on YouTube for Miss Sterling's class? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So it seems like they can, but they can't turn it quite quite all the way around, not quite all the way. And you guys actually can probably think of the reason why they need to do that. If I say it's a predator, why do you think? They would need to be able to turn Predator, their head. Why would it be useful to be able to turn I think I think you guys can figure this one out. I can tell you, but I think you're going to be able to figure it out. If I say it's a predator and they need to be able to, they're hunting for their food. They can watch you somebody to get them. I like it. Yeah. So they need to make sure that they need to be able to see is someone going to get me or am I going to be able to find some, some food for myself? Yeah. So awesome. I knew you guys would figure it out. Fantastic, guys. All right, Mr. McEwen's class. I know you guys are back now, so go for it. Come on in. Okay, this is uh, from Ben. Okay. How long can they survive without food or water? Ah. Oh, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to test it. Um, that would be something we'd have to look up because I, I, I don't know, actually. So I've got a few quick updates on this. So with a lot of owls, we've worked with groups that work with owls before. In the wild, a lot of owls eat something on the order of five to ten mice a day a large owl can eat, which is incredible. So they require a lot of food, just like us mammals. They need to keep their bodies warm at all times, and that's how they in part do that. We had snakes on live the other day, and the longest a snake's ever been recorded without eating is two years. So it really depends wow. on the kind of creature. Um, and if they're full-blooded or warm-blooded, it makes a really, really big difference. I love that question. All right, Rose Valley Elementary, Mr. Workacha's class. Come hey, on in for a question. Yeah, if you have a question. Yep, yeah. okay. Um, Say it nice and loud. Um, so how does um, what if if a turtle um gets swallowed by something? Because because lots of them are so small, like the one that it showed them. Okay. Don't they just get crushed by the digester? So would the turtle with the shell? You mean? Yeah. So I'm, oh. so I'm, the turtle would get crushed too. Okay, so if a turtle is eaten by something else, what happens with the shell? Yeah. And then okay. the turtle, you think then it put the turtle inside then you know get crushed. You know what? I'm going to be honest and say I don't know 100% for sure, but from just thinking about your question, I think a lot of animals would probably remove the meat from the shell before eating it. That would be my guess, but that would be a really good question to research. That, that would just, because you're right, the shell is, it's hard and it's protecting it. Yeah. Um, so I think, and you, if, uh, actually I still have them here. If you think about it, uh, I'll bring him out for a sec here. See, look, when he got a little bit nervous, he pulled his feet and his tail and his head. He was kind of like, hey, what are you doing? And then he pulled his feet and his tail and his head in so that the shell is actually protecting him. He doesn't have any anything sticking out right now so if they wanted to eat that would be kind of hard so i think usually they would try to kind of yeah. like if you think of a clam or something else in a shell the shell is to protect them from that exact problem so that would be my 
my guess to that answer. And it depends too on the, what's eating them. So if you're a huge yep. animal eating a turtle, sometimes young turtles have softer shells that would just go down. Bigger creatures like a shark or a crocodilian, that bite force is more than enough to crack bone. So just like if they ate a mammal, it would crack bone, turtle shell, same sort of deal. And stomach acid is really, really powerful. We talked about this in a pH presentation the other day and would help dissolve it. So neat question. I like where our head's at, guys. That's nice. We're, we're eating turtles whole here. Um, Ms. Holden's class, I'm going to come to you guys in just a second. I want to take a few rapid fire ones from YouTube. So, Mr. Rose class, Queen Elizabeth Public School, you guys have been like all week with us. I love it. How many animals are there at the Science Center with you guys? Oh, uh, Matt's going to have to help me out with this one. I believe we have around 10 right now. Um, we're actually readjusting our our cage we're actually getting some new enclosures right now which is really exciting there's lots of sad things about COVID, but one really good thing is that we are being able to re renovate our science center and matt's county <laughs> we have a lot actually um we've got some fish in a tank so i'm not sure if you'd count those individually <laughs> but we do have three salamanders two turtles um and a partridge in a pear tree basically and, yeah. uh we have a tarantula um oh. two snakes Nice. Um, so a bunch uh, of stuff. Yeah. This is um, great. Yeah. And um, I, I just want to actually also uh, jump in because I saw somebody ask about um, what are do turtles heads go right into the shell? Yes. Uh, so it's actually something where like the um, the shell is actually a modified version of their ribs. So their ribs are kind of on the outside. So that's something where like we want to be very careful uh, uh, with turtles because those shells aren't just like, uh, like, you know, fingernails or anything that's bone really. So what happened is over time, those uh, ribs have actually grown to the outside. So it's something where like, you can't like the head can actually kind of go inside, but like uh, they can't really like, you can't leave the shell because it would be sort of the same as us leaving our ribs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can't really jump out of your uh, skeleton. Uh, Very hard. Very hard. It would, it would take a whole lot of effort. Yeah. <laughs> very, very good. Yeah, if we, if we look at him for a sec, he can kind of, he can pull his head in a little bit. He's kind yeah. of doing it right now. But he'll kind of be able to pull it as far as the shell goes, I guess. Would be the the only exception to this, the box turtle, which we actually have in Ontario. We've got a lot of Ontario classes today. Can fold a shell and has a hinge in such a way that it makes it completely impenetrable. So some of those creatures that would otherwise pick out the meat, they can't because it becomes an impenetrable shell. It's very, very cool. I did not know that. That's amazing. There you go. I'll put that in the chat at the end. Um, Ms. Holden, one more second. I'm going to take one more quick one from YouTube. Ms. Brenna's class wants to know, how long can a turtle's tail get? What are we thinking, like? Oh, it kind of depends on the turtle. The one that we have here, his tail's probably... Oh, he's got it tucked in now, of course. <laughs> it depends on the size of the rest of the turtle. We have another turtle at the Science Center. You guys kind of saw how big my hands are, and his shell's about the size of my hand. But we have another turtle that her shell's actually the size of about a dinner plate. So her tail's quite a bit longer. So it would be in proportion to the size of the rest of their body. One of the things we discussed the other day too is that sometimes turtle tail lengths relate to their gender. So a male or female turtle have different tail lengths, which is kind of neat, just a fun little fact for you guys. All right, let's go to Miss Holden's class. Miss Holden joined us for, I think, 9,400 programs last year. It's an exact figure. Um, and so it's so nice to have them back in Spruce Grove, Alberta. Come on in, guys. Hey. Um, my question is about the salamander. If, okay. if the salamander holds their breath, has air in their skin, how do they breathe? Ooh. Oh, you guys have really tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I hadn't really thought of them holding their breath before. Basically, they can, because they've already lived in the water, they can process some of the oxygen that way. But I, I don't know about holding their breath. Yeah, it's, it becomes really weird when you think about these creatures that sort of live in water mm. or absorb air through skin. So the closest we can get, it's really, again, most of our kids today might not have ever had this experience. Kids can, by the age of like eight, start on their path to scuba diving. But when you scuba dive, there's a thing that they teach you where you basically just let the air flow around you and you sip it. It's like you're sipping air, it's like sipping juice, but you're sipping air. So a lot of creatures can do this. Sometimes you'll see bugs under the water that will have a big bubble on them. That bubble isn't just there by accident. It's their air pocket that they keep under the water with them that they're allowed to draw from. So it's really unique and odd and fun. Um, 
hard to know the exact figure. I don't think anyone's done any salamander respiratory length time studies. Although if you want to be a scientist, you could totally do that. Very, very cool. By the way, before we go to our next class, Miss Barbara's class, I'm going to come to you guys in just a second. I want to note that Matt is on our Mentimeter quiz, so uh, taking some questions there. He's sharing some questions. So if you guys want to play along on Mentimeter 2, you can do that uh, with the code on the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to leave that code up for you guys, and then I will head to Miss Barbara's class. So welcome in, Miss Barbara's group. They're joining us today, and my list is so big, I can't even find them. Miss Barbara, tell me where you're joining from when you come on in. Unmute your mic <laughs> and uh, go for it with a question. Hey, guys. Hey, nice to see you guys. Welcome to the class. We are from Roscoe, Illinois. Oh, yes, you are. You're on whole week. The whole week of wonder. You are representing the entire United States today. So I hope you guys are like super enthusiastic. Yay! <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, welcome in. Share a question with us. What do you guys want to know? Yes, JJ, did you have a question? Uh, What's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Uh, what is the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Nice. Oh, goodness, you guys. <laughs> I cannot remember. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm guessing that Jesse might, because you know what? I know more about turtles. I don't actually know that much about tortoises, but I so, think Jesse does. He has that kind of look. Like he wants, yeah. Steve Irwin was my hero as a kid, so reptiles were my life for like 10 okay. years. Um, so it depends where you are in the world. So turtles and tortoises, basically in North America, when we think of turtles and tortoises, turtles are things that are in the water. Tortoises are solely on land. So a tortoise won't walk into the water. They stay on land all the time. Turtles can be on land, but they typically live in or near water. Uh, and then it gets a little mixed up. Some of you might have heard this term. I'm going to put it in the banner, terrapin. So this is a whole different thing. Terrapin's like a freshwater turtle. You don't need to worry about that. From the Canada and U.S. perspective, turtle in water, tortoise on land. And we also call, of course, those things that are in the, the ocean sea turtles. So there's the seven species of those. So cool question, guys. Sheila, we're keeping you on your toes here. This is half the fun you, of this. You guys thought of some really unique questions. You know what? Yeah. I do workshops a lot, and I've never heard most of these questions before. Awesome. That's awesome. And um, now I have to go do some homework. Uh, I'm going to head to Winnipeg in a minute for uh, Mr. Albert Saw's class. Uh, they are going to join us at Immaculate Heart. Uh, but let's go to YouTube for just a quick couple before we go to our last two live. Mr. Feeney's group wants to know, can salamanders' limbs always grow back, Sheila? So it kind of depends with that injury. It And, uh, and the, the thing with that one is it had already healed by the time we saw it, um, by the time it came to the Science Center. So you notice that on its hand, it actually could regrow some of the fingers, but it wasn't able to regrow the eye. So it depends on what it is. If it was a limb or a tail, it depends how serious the injury was and where the injury was, if they would actually be able to regrow. Yeah. That was regrow. And, and to how much, because you saw that those two sides didn't match anymore. The fingers on the right. one hand are not quite the same anymore, but still better than not having the arm at all, right? So. Yeah. Very, very cool. I, by the way, that was Piper's question. I want to highlight that, Mr. Feeney's class. So animal regeneration in general is so, so cool. Think about yourselves. If you break a bone, it will heal. If you scratch yourself, that will heal. Salamanders have a little bit more of a capability than that. And my favorite animal for this in the world are sponges. So live, real animal sponges in the ocean. You can run them through a sieve. You can literally like shred them into pieces and they'll all just reform together and make a sponge. It's one of the coolest things in all of nature. All right, I'm heading to Immaculate Heart in just a second. What other question are we going to take? Miss Ford's class wants to know, do owls also eat worms? What do we think? Not the ones I've seen. <laughs> uh, there might be other uh, owls that do, but not that I know of. Not this one anyway. Um, it likes to eat things that are, they're just too small. They don't, they want something a little bit bigger. A little bit meatier, yeah. Yeah, and also if you think of where they would be hunting, usually they're flying around and they're looking for something that would be usually a mammal or a reptile. Yeah. Or an amphibian, yeah. It's like for us, it, you know, there's a little larva on a leaf. You don't necessarily want to eat it because it's not enough food to really satisfy you and you might be grossed out anyway, but uh, it really depends on the size of the animal, what it's trying to eat. So good question, guys. All right, in Winnipeg, I know you don't have a camera. You have a mic. If you want to unmute it, I will come to you for a second on a question. If not, you can share in the chat and go that way. But I'll go to Miss Gendron's class. Uh, if you guys have one for us, I'll pop you in. And uh, hey, do you have a question for us? Oh, that's our presenter, actually. <laughs> oh, our pre oh, sorry. Geez, our presenter. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome in. Do we want to share anything else before our, our broadcast ends in about five minutes? Um. 
Yes, she was going to talk to us. Actually, Fiji is from the First Nations University of Canada. So she's actually our neighbor. She's just across the lake here from us. And her specialty is native plant species in Saskatchewan. Uh, so cool. she knows lots about plants. She loves plants. And she was going to share a little bit with us on on that. Excellent. Well, we'd love to hear from you. We've got about five, 10 minutes of the broadcast left. So if you want to dive in and then if people have more questions, share in the chat. Matt's been highlighting things for our StreamYard chat. If you're on YouTube, we'll highlight a resource where you guys can check after the fact as well. But Fiji, if you want to dive in on, on native plant species, please go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. Okay. So can I share my screen? You can. So on the bottom of your screen, it says share, big plus symbol in the middle of the screen. And with that, you'll be able to put the PowerPoint you'd like. Okay. So do you see it now? No, we're not sharing just yet. That's okay. So, um... You know, we'll bring us all back in together. While you're trying to pull that up, I will highlight sasksciencecenter.com. If you guys want to check out more about the amazing work that they do with animals and more, I really encourage you to check out that site. Did you got your screen share up now? Perfect. So just get up your PowerPoint and we'll bring it in and we can share a few things before we wrap up today's broadcast. Okay. So, um, so you can see it now, right? I can see, I have your screen, but it's just your, all we're looking at is your screen right now, which is you looking at us in StreamYard as opposed to any slides. So what do you want me to do? Well, you need to go to your, if you're trying to show pictures, you'll need to bring up those pictures and then we'll be able to highlight them in the broadcast, okay? It's a, it's a PowerPoint pre presentation. Yes, and you, you'll have to go to that PowerPoint for us to be able to see it on our end. Uh, so what do you see exactly now? I see uh, us going into the distance infinitely. Right now you've got StreamYard up on your screen as opposed to the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, Jesse, wow. could she email you the presentation and we could- Yeah, but we, we won't be able to get it up in the next two oh, minutes okay. that way. So I think, yeah. While you're trying to pull the PowerPoint, I will just note ever so briefly for our, our friends at home, uh, if you guys are checking it, things out, again, sasksciencecenter.com, sciencecenter.com, lots of amazing resources there to keep the excitement going, and we are uh, still got quite a few programs left in our Week of Wonder. So if you guys want to check that out, please do uh, go to our Week of Wonder site, and you'll have lots more things to discover. Uh, Fiji, I mean, worst case scenario, if we want to share these slides with classes after the fact, so they can learn a little bit more about native plants, but we are in the final minutes of our broadcast. We should test it a little bit earlier for this. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so can I just talk? I'll stop sharing and- um, Stop sharing and you can talk to us for a few minutes. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, yeah, so I had a presentation about uh, native plants um, and climate change. So I just wanted to um, to mention that um, like if you if you look outside, you'll see lots of uh, plants. Some are native. When we say that they're native, it means that they, you know, like if we have a time machine and we go back hundreds of years ago, what would we see around us? The plants that we would see, these are what we call the native plants. They have not been introduced from Europe, for example. And when we talk about climate change, um, what we know is that there's going to be regions that will be uh, warmer and warmer and wa warmer. So plants in south and like in the southern part of uh, Saskatchewan, for example, um, while in the winter it gets really cold, but with climate change, what we expect, it might be that the temperatures will rise. It will become warmer and warmer. What it means is that the plants will have to, they will have to adapt to, to this. And um, so if the temperature like are getting warmer, plants will have to move uh, like up, right? Like they will have to go to colder regions. It's easy for animals to do that because they can walk and they can go up north where it's, um, where it's where it's colder, but plants they can't move, right? Like they grow in the soil, they have their roots in the soil, so they can't really move where it's colder, unless they have seeds that can be uh, wind um, 
uh, like they can be transported with wind currents, right? Like the seeds will um, will will transport the seeds to um, colder regions. So not all species have seeds that can travel in the wind, but some can. So if um, I don't know if you know about maple seeds, but for maple seeds, for example, like the they have big seeds and the seeds they look like helicopter. So they can actually travel in the wind and go where they uh, they have colder temperatures because that's what the that's the the right temperature for them. Um, and um, we know that in Canada, especially in Alberta and Saskatchewan, we have a lot of species like the aspen species. So for those of you who know what the aspen species are, like these species, they, um, they well, there has been a lot of mortality. Like these species are, they, they cannot adapt to the warmer climate and they will eventually, we think that they will disappear they will go up north. With flowers, what we see in Canada is that native plants that flower earlier in the spring, like uh, crocus, you know, like in the spring we see crocus, like it's one of the first plants that we see. If they do flower too early in the spring because of warmer temperature, what's gonna happen is that they'll get damaged because there's a higher chance of spring frost. And these plants will, because they, they started to grow too early in the season, they will be damaged or they will be killed uh, next time that there's a big frost. So what I, um, so like that climate change has an impact on, um, on, on, on plants. And what we can do, uh, you can do it in your schoolyard, you can do it at home, is to plant more native plants. So that would be my, my take home lesson for today. Fantastic. So nice of you to join us today and highlight this. I'm sorry that we mixed it up a little bit near the end there, but again, planting native pollinator gardens is something that we've featured on so many broadcasts as an organization. So truly, think of your backyard as a space where you can really control what the ecosystem is. You can help bring in native pollinators, so many other species, um, and I'm, I'm so glad we got that message in. If you want to check out, again, First Nations University, I really encourage people to check out that website as well. A really special and unique institution in all of Canada. And uh, Ms. Gender, thank you so much for joining us today, guys. Um, Sheila and Matt, day. oh, there we go. Uh, Sheila and Matt, thank you guys so much for an amazing presentation with our live animals on Mentimeter and more. Uh, a few of our classes had to dip off for other things, but what we do to end every broadcast is Miss Donninger, Miss Barber, and our folks in Winnipeg. If you guys want to join us in saying a big thank you and farewell today, you are all on the broadcast. Have a wonderful day, everybody.